Volume 2. Really? Well, we finished the part about dreams, but you can extend a little. So we're now at Volume 2. Now, as you said on Shabbat, Yes. There isn't really much difference between volume one and volume two. There isn't a there isn't a clear separation. Well, yes and no. That's what we'll get to in a moment. The problem is, why did God make, or the rabbis decide to call this a separate book? Why call it Exodus? It's a very simple question. Call it uh, nothing. Just keep going in the story. You've got a story of development starting with God creating the world, descending to Noah, the flood generation, the tower generation, coming back up again with Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, wavering a bit, Yaakov's family, get out to Egypt, they become a people, and they get the Torah. That would have been a nice point to stop the story, at the point that they got the Torah. Then ever after, it's how they keep the Torah, all the details of the Torah, that might have made a nice division. What is our division? I think our division is that up to then, you know, the Jewish people were like, and then all of a sudden in Egypt, when they started moving out of Goshen, and the Egyptians started hating them, and it was the start of anti-Semitism and so on. So you say well, this is well, the before Christ then, before then, you know, the Jewish people were like, and Potiphar, you know, was one of the most uh, nicest rulers the Jewish people ever had, you know. And then, then all of a sudden, things started going wrong. And That's a very interesting theory. Leave. Your theory is that this is the book of anti-Semitism. Right? This is when Jew hatred becomes prominent. Did we have Jew hatred before this in the Bible? You could say Asaph hates Yaakov, but there it's a personal thing, a tug of war for leadership. He doesn't hate him for being Jewish. Maybe. It's not so clear. It's not so clear. Maybe. Well, I've got I can hear that. But so anti, this would be the book that starts anti-Semitism. Why does anti-Semitism only start in this book? Well, they made the move out is later. The anti-Semitism is while they're there. Actually, there's the anti-Semitism in Egypt. In Egypt, this is the anti-Semitism. I didn't think so. Slavery. slavery. It's economics. Slavery. It's economics. They got they got a good deal going. Jews do their work. Yeah, they don't hate them to be. No, they're, they're, they're not rich. So how they would? Yeah. Why would they hate them? They so I don't think that. No, I don't. I'm, you know, as I'm thinking out loud, I'm not sure I accept that. Amalek is anti-Semitism, but Amalek comes much later in the book. Amalek wants to wipe them out because they exist, like Hitler. If there's a Jew in the world, Amalek wants to wipe him out, and he comes from far off to wipe him out. But, uh, Amalek is not threatened. They want to take the land of Amalek. Amalek but, comes to be the Exodus and the Torah. Right? Yeah, so, Yosef could have been the anti-Semitist. He, he might have been because he was successful. But we don't see that they all like Yosef, pretty much. They, everybody liked Yosef. So we, I would have to reject it. It's not the book of anti-Semitism. What is it the book of? Traveling. <laughs> yeah. uh, traveling to Egypt? No, they're in Egypt already in Vayigash. Uh, it's the book of the return journey to heaven. This is what I said. The return Rashi. journey to heaven? No, they yeah, don't return from Vayigash. The is Adam, Noah, and then Abraham is like the seed. Abraham is the seed of the Jewish people. He's planted in the mundane world. Mm -hmm. And then from Egypt they're born. It's like the. Um, That's, the later. That's later. Okay. That's no, later. Now we're talking about them coming out of Egypt. No, with the beginning of Exodus, they're going. They're they're getting enmeshed in Egypt. They're becoming rich and powerful and slaves. So they're growing. They're like the baby in the womb now. Well, they're maybe Abraham is the seed. Now it's the baby in the womb. We've got many generations. They're in and Egypt already. Like, two parches ago. Okay, so it's the yeah. nine months. The nine months. It's more than nine months. It's a long time. The, yes, the Exodus actually is what it says. Get out. We're moving out. That's later. Yeah, but what is unique? You hear the question I ask? A very simple one. If there is a book which is called by a separate name, whether you call it Exodus or the Rabban calls it Sefer HaGa'ula, the Book of Redemption, or the Baal Hilchot Gedolot, signed by the Hebek Dalvar, calls this book Sefer Shani, Volume 2, very mysterious name. Whatever you call it, it should have a theme. Otherwise, why make it a separate book? Does it have something to do with believing in God? That, uh... Nothing about that in the beginning. So what is the theme of this book? Very simply. 
You can't say the theme is going down to Egypt and coming out of it, because two parshas ago they're already down in Egypt. And in Vayigash. All of Vayichi, they're in Egypt. So that can't be the theme. You can't really call it the book of Exodus, in my opinion, because that's much later. So you could have started the book of Exodus, and also I suggested Mount Sinai. You might have started the book of Exodus, and that's like a big change, a big step forward. But the book starts way before Exodus. So what would you call the book of? Could you call it the book of Moshe? Possibly. That's an interesting idea. Sefer Moshe. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anyone do so, but it's a reasonable suggestion. Because right at the beginning, we have Moshe being born. Uh, not bad. That's a possibility. The book of Moshe. Moshe's career, Moshe's ascendancy. Yeah, but all the, all the other books of Moshe as well. Uh, they're, yes, they're but, but this is Moshe's emergence, let's call it that. Let's take it for granted. He's a leader in the other books. You could say something like that. And it, it occurs it's quite Shlod, soon. the names? Yes, why call it the names? That's not much of the book. That's not the theme of the book, names. Why is it called Shemot? Oh, the second word happens to be Be'ele Shemot. But why call the book by that name? Or why make a book just because of that fact? It's a better way to phrase it. And Moshe actually doesn't come along until chapter 2. There's a whole chapter before Moshe, so that one almost makes it. But still, but if we say it starts with Yochebe, yeah, yeah. But any other guesses? To what is the theme of this book? I would say the theme is the Jewish nation. We end Beratius with a Jewish family. Beratius starts with the downfall of universal man. Adam, Eve, and company go to pot, literally and figuratively. Cain uh, kills his brother, act of aggression followed by the terribly aggressive generation of the tower. Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit, the crime of passion, followed by the flood generation. So the world goes downhill, and God chooses a model to set them back, Avraham and his descendants. But the first stage of a model is to make a balanced man. Avraham's not balanced. Avraham is chesed, outreach, going out, conquering. He's not the deep inner gesture. Yitzchak, his son, achieves Gevura, and they each lose one son, who's like them in personality but opposite in values. Yitzchak achieves Gevura, Ezek Yivar Kovashit Yitzro, who is powerful, he who conquers his own impulse. That's Yitzchak. He's deep, he's quiet, he's disciplined. You don't see him reaching out so much. Yaakov puts them both together and makes Tifera Seremus. So Yaakov is ideal man. So is ideal man enough for a model for a people? Is ideal man enough for all mankind to follow him? I would say no. Because no matter how ideal you are, no matter how kind you are, no matter how intelligent, how sweet, unless you can form family, you're not a developed natural person. A developed natural person lives man and woman and has children. So to have an ideal for mankind, a natural ideal for them to follow, we have to wait till somebody produces a family where they all follow his tradition of being a model, and that's Yaakov. And we go through all the ups and downs of the process. He almost loses children, they fight with each other, all kinds of problems. He's in mourning for 20 years, Yaakov is miserable. The image of the happy tzaddik, always dancing and laughing, Ben the Rebbe Tanz, Tanz and Allah Chassidim, is not the image of the Yaakov. The Yaakov have sad lives often, difficult lives, straining lives, horrible lives even. So for 20 years, Yaakov is in misery. But finally, the family does get together, all clustered around his bedside, and he's achieved, I would say, reasonably the stage of family. Nobody leaves, and everybody goes on to form a tribe in Israel. So that finishes the book of creation, the book of Genesis, where we have a natural model to inspire mankind to come back to what they should have been, back to themselves in Eden. The next stage, however, is not natural. It is in a sense, because it seems to occur all over the world, but it's not within biological nature. It's the formation of larger groups called nations. That I would call a sociological, not a biological creation. But still, it's part of this process of creating models to bring man back to the point where he should have been a creation. So the nation formulation could be very well called, as the Hilchel Kedola does, Volume 2, Genesis 2. This stage, we now make a nation which will be a model to all other nations. That's the cutting point. Now, if that is the cutting point, 
How should our book start about a nation? You'd start where we left off with the family. Families all around his bedside. They uh, bury Yaakov. Yosef dies. He's buried in Egypt. That's how we ended last week's center of the book he's of birth. Right. He's put in the coffin in Egypt. That's how we ended it. The Abaddon, he was put in the coffin in Egypt. What should come next now? I would say verse 6 in our portion. Exodus 1, 6. And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. And the children of Israel multiplied like mad, multiple births and quick uh, marriage, early marriage, and, and many deliveries. And they got powerful and mighty, and the land was filled with them. They no longer stayed in Goshen Green Ghetto. They went all, all over Egypt. That's the next stage. And they become a people. And Pharaoh gets scared, and it oppresses them. And that makes them a stronger people. As they oppressed them, so they grew stronger. And finally, God takes them out and so forth. So if you just forget about the first five verses, the whole book can be called The Story of the Formation and the uh, definition as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation of the Jewish people. Okay, that's good. That's Hirsch, that's everybody. That's good. Very good. The only problem is the first five verses. But the first five verses are not a problem in defining the book. They're a problem in themselves, no matter how you define the book, because they're absolutely superfluous and redundant. What are the first five verses? It's a repetition of the last part of Bereshit. Not even a good one. The last part of Bereshit is about Yigash. We went in detail, Yaakov and the 70 souls who came down, including not just children, but grandchildren. Here it just says the names again. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt with Jacob. Funny, Israel, Jacob here. Every man came with his household, Reuben, Shimon, and Levi, the names of the sons. And again, it says all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, and Joseph was in Egypt already. We had all that. We had it in far richer detail. So the question is, what do these first five verses do? Why are they here? Now, the heretics, like the Encyclopedia Judaica professors from the Hebrew University and all, the heretics say, see, these were all separate books once. And since they were separate books, and you might have Exodus in front of you, the story of the nation, and not have Genesis in front of you, so they give you a little background. Jacob and his 12 sons came down to Egypt. That's what the heretics say in the Encyclopedia Judaica. And then they say the book ends with God's presence in the Mishkan, in case you don't have a copy of Numbers handy, so they give you a little uh, preview, like Saturday afternoon at the movies, they show the coming week's attractions in America, or late at night on the television. Right? So that's what the Encyclopedia Judaica says. Of course, people with much deeper insight and tradition have much more beautiful messages than those trivial ones. So do we hope, like Eshel says, Revelation is an ongoing, even today, an ongoing phenomenon? I don't know how he defines that, so I can't comment. Certainly, it does not contradict anything earlier. You could say God is constantly revealing things to man, uh, atomic energy videos, I and mean, those are revelations of God too. Nobody could have dreamed of such a wonderful thing as a video. We had people get married in our place. They were married 25 years. They found they were married by reformed rabbis. They decided for the 25th anniversary they're going to go on to a higher stage. And they got married with their children and saying Shema Brachos and so forth. Beautiful thing. They were there right now as I left watching it the last time, uh, the video. Uh, everybody at the wedding stayed over hours to watch the wedding again on video. It was incredible. Milton made a wonderful video. Yeah, really and it was incredible. Now, that added such a dimension to that experience. Who would have dreamed, 10, 15 years ago even, that you'd have a wedding and you'd be able to watch an instant replay? Like on sports. Now, yeah. You'd have instant replay and beautiful color, beautiful detail right on your television set. Amazing. So God is always revealing new things to man. New human possibilities too, jogging, aerobics, whatever it is. People are always discovering. God's world is never exhausted. It's all there. Yeah, it's all there if you look hard enough and, and keenly enough. And that's why some of the Midrashim say the sin of the tower generation was that they stayed in one place. God said you should fill the whole earth. The Jews are in the central command headquarters here in Jerusalem. They've got to stay in Israel and develop the model nation. But everybody else is supposed to explore the whole world, go all over. And when they want to be one language in one place, they were violating God's original command. They'll miss the great discoveries to be made in Alaska and Antarctica and, uh, and uh, Tasmania and so forth. 
So it's very important that you must explore the whole Torah and the rest of the nations must explore the whole world. All right, so this is the Book of Nationality. So these first verses are very difficult. So the most beautiful and simple explanation, not the silly Bible critics one, the most beautiful one is Rabbi Hirsch's. Rabbi Hirsch says, it's very simple. He says, a nation is a necessary but dangerous entity. The danger in a nationality, in patriotism, is that you overlook individual and familial differences. Remember, the building blocks of man, the natural building blocks, are the individual and the families we just discussed in Boratius. In the process of building an artificial entity, a sociological entity, you may find that suddenly individual differences have to be put down. And that's the Tower of Babel story. You may find that family loyalty is discouraged because family loyalty may just contradict national loyalty. The old Arab father and mother may tell their son that he's doing something very stupid with the anti-father. So it's in the interest of the anti-father not to have family loyalties in that sense. The communists urged people to denounce their own parents, the Nazis. Those who worship collective man as a power instead of God to which helpless man can turn and with which he can identify. Those people have to put down your own thoughts and feelings like a cult, like a Hasidic uh, Rebbe even or a Rosh Hashiva who, where in a case where everybody tries to think just like him and say he's always right and, and they forget analyzing the things themselves and exploring their own feelings. So, so the Jewish nation, Rav Hirsch says, is not built on suppression of individuality and suppression of family ties. On the contrary, that to be a model to the world and to be a strong and healthy and holy nation, it has to be built on strong and healthy and holy individuals and families. Therefore, before the Torah goes on, it says all 12 of Yaakov's sons retain their individual unique identities. These are the names of the children of Israel who are coming into Egypt. At this moment, too, they're all dead already, that generation. But they're always coming into Egypt as such. And each man came with his household. Right? And from these 70 came the whole nation. So that's what our verse says. This is a, a warning and background to nation formation that you must not forget individual identity and family formation. Good? Okay, that solves that. Let's go on. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. Now there, Rashi had said last week that last week's portion by Yechi was a closed portion. It did not have the usual nine letter empty space before it. It's stuma not petucha. Rashi said that's because this is a hint that there was a closing up when Yaakov died. Because when Yaakov died, the affliction began. The hearts and eyes of the Jews were closed up when Yaakov died. Let me read the next verse. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Does that sound like the oppression began? Their eyes and hearts were stopped up. No, on the contrary. This is way after That's Yaakov. Why Joseph was alive. No, this is after he died, the verse before. And Joseph died in all his brethren. The last connection with Yaakov, Yosef, and the Tobos Yaakov, Yosef. Yosef is the perpetuation of his father. When he dies, Yaakov is dead. After that, they were doing wonderfully, absolutely wonderfully, till the new king came, till uh, Jesse Jackson or no, I, got away. You know, there's always confusion with the tents. I think it's referring to the increase while well, Yosef was alive. I doubt it. You because could say they them. had multiplied, yeah. Yeah. but I, they I, had I, multiplied. They yeah, had right. multiplied. Yeah, it must be that. I don't think so. Look, because, because it also, excuse me, it says, and the earth was full of them. I doubt right. if that happened. In, and then I says, doubt if that happened in Yosef's lifetime. And then it because says, they now, probably stayed with Yaakov. And then it says, now there arose a new king of Egypt. But that after now Yosef is, died. There's no Hebrew. After form. they'd increased. And he also ever died. The two things. No, no, it says he did not know Joseph, so it applies sometime after. Obviously, we know Joseph was just after Joseph's death. On the contrary, that shows there was some time in elapsed. I would say the better reading and the simpler one is that after Joseph died is exactly when uh, they were multiplying and doing well. The Ibn Ezra says uh, Joseph died while still in office before evil days came upon his brethren. So, 
Well, how can you say that the, that the uh, persecution began when Yaakov died? How can you say that? And that their eyes and hearts were closed. So my theory is that the persecution of the Jews does not begin with persecution. It begins with something far more subtle. Suddenly, when the Jews begin to work hard and prosper and do well and become leaders, it breeds a certain uncomfortable feeling among the local, local lazy slouches at the saloon and so forth. And that uncomfortable feeling, I mean, they, they wouldn't do anything bad to the Jews, they wouldn't even express it perhaps. Of course, they see the Jews are wonderful, they save the country, they do so much, they contribute so much, but you know, nobody wants to be around such super people. Just like individuals often can't stand being around super people. It makes them feel petty. They have to find something wrong with the great people because they can't stand the idea that they're not great, which the great person shows to them. So Israel is often in that position. So, they, so there's a funny, vague feeling that the Jews aren't really one of us, and yet they're taken over. And what's the Jewish response to that vague feeling? They try harder to make sure they are one of them. Got it? The Jews' senses that there's a difference and perhaps a precarious nature in his newfound success and position. So he tries to be more like them to get favor in their eyes. And that would fit very nicely. That's the beginning of the shibud of the enslavement. That the hearts and eyes of the Jews are closed. They have to close their eyes to a lot of things about this brave new world. They have to close their hearts to sense of the feeling about it. Because little by little, little by little, they're beginning to get assimilated into Egyptian place. Only later do there come the Nuremberg Laws and Kristallnacht and so forth. That's a much later stage. First, the Jews of Germany must assimilate to show that they're really 100% Germans who served in the Kaiser's army and were decorated and so forth. The Golish Telford will not help them, but that's the first step. All right. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. New king can have two meanings. The Medrash says it may mean a new king, or it may mean Change a renewed king that the king made himself over. Went to plastic surgeon, whatever he did. Went to a good uh, shrink. The king turned a new tack. Now, if we take the first explanation that it's a new king completely, it's still very hard to understand how he could not know about Joseph. He's one of the most famous men in Egyptian history. If you take the position it was the same king, same pharaoh who just changed his tack, well, that's even more difficult because he certainly knew Joseph. Unless you mean a new king at some point in history after that pharaoh had died. Sir, you, yeah. didn't you remember some of the theories that there was a whole a conquest? I think you brought that I'm going up. to bring that in a minute. But before we get to that, my son Ariel asked, how could it be? Joseph died in 110. He was a young boy when he started. Most presumably the pharaoh whom he knew was dead, even in his lifetime. And if we're talking like a... A while later, a couple generations later, certainly that pharaoh would be dead. How could the rabbi say it was a pharaoh made himself new? Or you could say it's a later pharaoh who suddenly made himself new. It just occurred to me. That could be an answer. But I had a different answer the other day. My answer last night was this. Don't take the rabbis too seriously in the Medrash. What do I mean? It's my contention that when the rabbis interpret the Torah, they do not do it so much to give the true meaning of the Torah as to give a good message. Rabbi Hadari said they only had the people once a week. Everybody worked. You know, I was back in the days before Colwells and welfare. Everybody worked. You had the people one day a week on Shabbos. They'd come to shul, listen to the drasha. They might fall half asleep. You had to keep them interested too. So you had to make up fantastic stories and all kinds of interesting things. Anything to keep them awake. And if you had any important things to discuss, you had to squeeze it into the Parsha Shabbat Because that was the rules of the game. That was the genre, that was the accepted mode of discourse. And on Shabbos, the rabbi talked about the drasha, about an exposition of the Parsha Shabbat So if you had something very important to say to them, you have to somehow connect it up to the Parsha. Even if the Parsha really didn't mean that. It didn't matter. It's a style. It's a literary style. So I would say one problem throughout Jewish history was trying to figure out the evil monarchs who persecuted them. We will have in a few weeks a medrash which argues 
was one frog they called all the other frogs, or did all the other fro all the frogs come up to you? I mean, it almost seems ridiculous. What do they care? And, and how could you know? And the Torah doesn't speak about. It. But they, they may be asking a question: How do we solve the problem of persecution? Is it that we have to find the Hitler or the Arafat and assassinate him, the one evil one who stirs them all up? Or is that a waste of effort? Is that futile? Because it's the people who make the leader and pick him. If you kill that one, they'll pick another one just as bad or worse. Very hard to know. Did one frog call them all, or did they all come up on their own? Now, they wanted to get that message in. If they talked about the kings directly, they'd get bumped off, too. So they have to put it into the Parsha Shavuah, both for the sake of their listeners and for the sake of their, the safety of their own lives from the authorities. So I would say here, too, there's a similar discussion. Do we assume that it's just a case of a good king or a bad king, or even the best king can suddenly go bad? Is it a new king or is it the king of a king? Not that they actually believed it was that same king as with Yosef. But simply this was a way of explaining this idea using the biblical text as a takeoff, as an asmachta. Very possible, who knows. The other idea I came up with now is the idea that it was a renewed king or a changed king. May not refer to the original one with Yosef, but another one somewhere along the line. Okay, so this uh, new or renewed king, and uh, as Baruch mentioned, we discussed uh, Reb Hankin's ideas, Yehuda Hankin's, that Joseph came specifically in the hundred year period when Egypt had been conquered by the Hiskis, Syrians who may have been monotheistic, Semitic, and the Egyptians were ruled in their own country. And at that point, Joseph found favor in their eyes, they appreciated him, but when a new king came, when they kicked them out, the Egyptians came back to rule, a hundred years later or so, whenever it was exactly, then they were afraid the Jews who were Semites would join their enemies, the Hiskis, the Syrians, and, take, and let them take over the country again if there's war. It's also a possibility. Okay. So the new king came. Who didn't know Joseph? Still, new king, old king. How can he not know Joseph? In Russia, they do change history, and names are rubbed out of textbooks and so forth. But he wouldn't know about them. Very difficult to conceive. I would say the simple answer to that is the word Yodea doesn't mean no. The word Yodea, for example, where do we first have Yodea used in the Chumash? To the best of my recollection. Where? Vayeda Adam et Chava Ishto. Adam knew his wife Eve. God made a woman. What do you mean knew her? Of course he had seen her already. Of course he knew her, that she existed. So the rabbis say it means sexual relationship. They live together. So why do you use the word no? Because that's a deeper knowing. It's not just an intellectual knowing, an abstract knowing. It's a knowing of empathy, a knowing of oneness, where you feel at one with the object to which you are relating or studying. So he knew his wife means they were really one. So I would say the same thing here. He didn't know Joseph. Sure, he knew the facts. There was a Joseph, and Joseph had saved Egypt. But not intimately knowing Joseph, and Joseph being long dead, he could make up a story. Yeah, Joseph did all these things. It was to get a central Egypt and scatter the Egyptians all over so the Jews could feel equal, and then the Jews would take over. And all the money he got from Pharaoh and all the central government, it's all going to wind up in the Jews' hands, like the elders of the uh, prodigals of the elders of Zion. So therefore, this new king, he knew about Joseph in the intellectual sense. He didn't know Joseph, Joseph's dedication and selflessness and integrity and so forth. This stuff he didn't know. So that's our new king. So okay, yes. In Egypt, it is known that certain kings would come into power and would try to eradicate all of his uh, predecessors' name wherever there were monuments. Like and Russia. Carve them off. It's a possibility. And so it's not a, 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 a new practice. No, but it doesn't say here, Rekhi didn't know. He simply didn't know. It's hard to conceive the king wouldn't know. Yes, uh, mm, I mean, there used to there are many, many cases the king would kill off all his rivals. Yeah. In Shakespeare's play, King Henry the Fourth, part, part two, there's a scene where the new king is being crowned. And he says to, and the new king comes along, King Henry V, and he says, Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English court, not the Turkish. Yeah, but at the same time, Again, if he really knew Joseph, he wouldn't fear. There's nothing to fear. Joseph's a good citizen. The Jew is maybe an overly good citizen. He'll put up with almost anything. Maybe it means he didn't acknowledge him. He didn't Great, acknowledge maybe that. Maybe, maybe. But, but I'm saying it can't be simple information. It's far-fetched to assume he, he didn't know him. He was one of the uh, top people. In yeah, well, he's dead already. But he was one of the top people for
for the opposition yeah, party, yeah, that's what we not said for the first. revolutionary yeah, party. And so, yeah. so well, not only did he know, he said he yeah. helped those. Uh -huh. Now I am I am from the people who we 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 now threw out, uh -huh. and so he must be their friend. He, he didn't see yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the his kiss thing we mentioned uh, before. I would say it was the, the population explosion, and and they were scared. Uh, uh, the numbers oh, are the numbers are uh, right. great. And they, it's like the secular Israelis. The secular Israelis are now frightened to death and all the political power that the Haredim are getting. So I told some secular women, you don't want this to be a Haredi state, so you have babies. Raise them to be nice little secular valueless people, fine. Or uh, with modern secular values, whatever those are. But raise them, have five, ten kids. You lead a sacrificial life too. And then you may find you have more in common with the Haredi lady. So they don't want a Haredi country, they've got to have a whole bunch of babies too. So, and the Egyptians, it's very conceivable that given the uh, decadent uh, sex as a snack nature of their culture, it could be like the modern West the today. They weren't into having babies a lot, the higher the Egyptians places. Egyptians have a lot of babies because they're now, primitive. Now, I'm speaking then, the high class uh, Egyptian I society, I don't know, I, it's very conceivable that the high class Egyptian society would not want their women to be spoiled physically or as playmates by having babies. Rashi points out already that that I think it's uh, Lamech takes uh, two wives because one for a girlfriend and one for a uh, mother. And the mother felt terrible because she was all alone while he was out in the town with the girlfriend. And the girlfriend felt terrible because she was leading this weird unnatural life of sex without babies. Like the Americans today, mm -hmm. you know, they, they lead this abnormal life where they don't mate and have babies till very old. And so they, they feel bad, they're not natural. Forget religious, they're not natural. So what do you do? You start stressing, eating granola and jogging, and, and buying your kids only pure wooden toys from Finland instead of colorful plastic toys from Korea. It's a craving for naturalness, which borders on a religious gesture, because they realize the essence of their lives is not natural. They're not having babies. So, you can't believe that poor Arabs are having babies. They lead a natural, healthy life. It's the Jews' fault for not having it. If the Jews would have a lot of babies too, there's no population problem here. There's no problems at all, probably, if, if most of the Jews were that. All right. So he said to his people, look, the children of Israel, this is, they're now called the children of Israel, interesting. Ravi Atsumi Menu, they're powerful and strong and multiplying from us, or more than us. You could translate this two ways. Come, let's be wise with them. You see, Egypt is a democracy, like Soviet Russia has a constitution, and the Jews did so much good, and they're so prominent. And nobody wants to do anything so direct at first. At first, there's just that feeling of discomfort to which the Jews respond with assimilation. After that, they begin to make all kinds of sneaky plans to try to destroy the Jewish people. Nothing overt. Let us be wise with them, lest he multiplies. And when war will come, he will join on our enemies, because the Egyptians will go out to fight, and Jews will be left back home, and they'll let the enemies in the back door. For they'll come Badu, and they'll fight with us, the Alami Aretz. And they'll go out of the land. You see already at this point, maybe, they're trying to hold the Jews in the land. And what did they do at first? They just put a special foreign residence tax. They put uh, special tax collectors. Or maybe they just had the income tax people visit them every week or two and find problems, like here in Israel. All of a sudden, it's like gangbusters. A guy walks into a store, close the store, open your books. It's really like out of gangbusters. Not the American way, excuse me, so we're playing an audit, maybe uh, you can come to our office a month from now. All right? So they placed income tax inspectors in order to afflict them with burdens, and they built two storage cities for Pharaoh. Peace some around says, it doesn't mean, in my opinion, at this stage, it doesn't mean they physically built them. It means they paid for them. A special patriotic war effort by the Jews. And as they oppressed them, so they multiplied. By the way, does everybody know where this I don't know. And the other I'm not an archaeologist. And so, so yeah, the more they oppressed them, so they multiplied, and so they scattered all over, and they couldn't stand the Jews. They found the Jews obnoxious trying to get into their country clubs. I mean, it's hard. It's much harder to become a country club member than a reformed Jewish convert. But uh, at the same time, they would make the effort, and the Jews were getting there. And so the Egyptians 
persecuted the Jews before. Now they began to be really cruel. And these are all stages. Uh, the more the Jews stay, it's hard to tell exactly uh, how long they could have still gotten out. Like the Iranians today are in such terrible shape because they wouldn't leave their wealth 20 years ago. When they could have gotten out, or even less. So they began to treat the Jews with great cruelty. And they made their lives bitter with all kinds of hard work. Now we're speaking about work. With, with uh, cement and bricks and all kinds of field work. They, whatever they did, they made them work uh, really like dogs. And then uh, the rabbi said they gave a male female's work and a female a male's work. That breaks them even more. And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, the chief uh, obstetricians of the time, the name of one was Shifra, the name of the other Pua. There's all kinds of drushes and explanations of their names and their function. Some say they were Egyptian women, some say they were Mary Miochevet, who knows. And he said, when you help them give birth, and you see on the birth stones, it's a, it's a boy, see that he dies. I like kill him, so again, it's all covert, not over again. And when they, they'll, they'll treat them very harshly at this stage, overtly. They wouldn't kill him overtly at this stage. So he said, if you see, after all, it's a civilized country, Egypt, one of the leading countries of the time. So he says, if it's a boy, kill it. And if it's a girl, cause it to die, actually. So you see to it that it doesn't get the right attention or it's smothered oh, or something like that. Oh, back? Smothered. Yeah. It doesn't mean cause it to die. Any right. time I would say. But it, I thought it was only the boys that... Yes, only the boys. And if it's a little girl, keep her alive. We'll take the women. Right. The women are subordinate. They won't be able to control our country or anything. And they had awe of God. These women had awe of God, these midwives. And they didn't do what Pharaoh said, the king of Egypt. And they even helped the little boys to live. Not that they just didn't kill them or cause them to die, they made them live. So what should Pharaoh do? He calls them. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, or the king of Egypt called to the midwives and said, how come you've done this and you've made them live? And they said, look, what can we do? These aren't like Egyptian women. These are wild Jewish women. They're like wild animals. Before we get there, they've already given birth. One, two, three, comes the signs. He rushes her in the taxi. She has the baby ready in the chariot. What uh, would you have done were you Pharaoh at this point? Chop their heads off. Yeah, he has to argue with these, uh, these women. Just kill them. It's obvious they're not. Don't ask why you're doing it and think of some kind of flimsy excuse. It's a ridiculous excuse. Just kill them. Then he wouldn't have midwives. So get some other midwives. Of course, doesn't mean these are midwives. These are the heads of the midwifery, like the like the chief butler and the chief steward and so forth, uh, chief baker. So I would say that again, this is like a very cautious society. That this is a persecution which is not officially sanctioned even, and it's Pharaoh organizing things behind the scenes in a sneaky way. And when they refuse, all right, it's dangerous for them, but he's not going to kill them right away because he doesn't want any waves. And who knows, he may be afraid of the breakdown of Egyptian society. Uh, there's something confusing about killing the, the boys off and keeping the girls. So, what I can impregnate a hundred women, you know. Oh, it's very easy. Uh, read some biology books. All right, now. <laughs> but now, the, the, uh, the Lord was... Around. Yes. Uh, if there were lots of men and no women, then birth would stop. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, it, it, the other way around. He, he's, wow. not stopping, he's not slowing down the birth. No, but he, as I said, he's worried about see, an uprising yeah. of the Jewish men. They will join the enemy and make an uprising. So he has to kill them. And why not kill the women? Because they can't lead an uprising. And they want the Jewish woman. I mean, a Jewish girl is much nicer than a cheap um, Egyptian floozy. Right. A Beis Yaakov <laughs> girl is far preferable to a Nancy Kissinger. Yes, were, 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 How do you know? No, I'd say she's cheap. Very good <laughs> They My wife told me, yeah. They teach women, we're very pretty. <laughs> pretty, yes, but uh, sluts. Well, we're not allowed to say that, by the way. We're not allowed to enjoy anything Egyptian. Uh, uh, you, do you have any uh, uh, Queen of the Nile? Yes. Um, we, we, we seem to have lost is. a precept that the ancients had that the wealth of the nation were in its population, and the more people the nation had, the greater its wealth, the more valuable were its product that had greater gross national product, it had a higher more productivity. Not only more workers, but it, more ideas were, were yeah. brought in. 
And today, modern man has, has, has lost the concept of, of the agents. Well, I wouldn't say he's lost we the concept. We have plenty of natural resources. Well, he's so worried about natural resources as an excuse have, for being lazy. It's because it's not, kids are a pain in the neck. And, ah, and, 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 most, and most Jewish sources say have them anyway. But there's people like the Rambam's family who discourage having a lot of children. Or That's because the Rambam came from the Gullahs. He didn't want to make well, the Gullahs. Well, it's nothing to do with Gullahs. You'd have maybe because you never know. There'd be one that will turn out to be very... Yes, there was an article really? once in the Jerusalem Post. Everyone should have ten yeah. children. Of course, who knows? One might give That's up the right. faith. One might move to America. God forbid someone can die. Mm -hmm. Someone can be incompetent. So if you have about ten, it's reasonable insurance for your old age that somebody will be around. That was the, reason, was the original reason that people had so many children. Yeah, so. Well, the basic reason is biology. If people live naturally and go by natural feelings, they'll have children, regardless of calculations. But there are also calculations. But the infant mortality rate used to be... Um, High. 50%. More than 50%. Yeah, well, I'm talking about... There are two families here, each one with 20 children. They mm. were shown, and they didn't seem to be magnificent mm. families. The very, very large families I've seen are fine. And they're yeah. really fine. Certainly. Your mother <laughs> okay. yeah, there's a lot of Arab families like that, too. There's a lot of Arab families. Yeah. Yeah. In an agrarian society, children need family. servants. Mm -hmm. And children are cheaper than servants. But they, they're often more in trouble. Uh, <laughs> children talk back. And nobody uh, wants, nobody wants right workers to talk Denver. back. I mean, it's aggravation. It makes them sick. Women so, don't go back. They um, actually. Yeah. In those but, days. But before children didn't talk, they just kept in. And yes, that's true. I'm, I'm reflecting contemporary that's thing. Something, yeah. That is true. And that's what's making it hard for us because we were not like that. And yes. now our children are not different. And Rev Cook said, the con he hard. said the contemporary chutzpah is a sign the Mashiach is coming. That's right. Because it says in the time of the Mashiach, no one will that's teach his right. friend. Yeah. Everybody will see God directly. Don't tell me I know what's right. Chutzpah. Yeah, he says the chutzpah is. Yeah, right. and the, and the, and the student, the by the the teacher, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good part of Chutzpah. They may be jumping the messianic gun a bit, but it's the <laughs> idea of a striving for independence, of, of uh, not feeling a need for dependence upon a father figure or authority figure. And you know, it gets complicated, these things. Uh, how some people thrive on having people dependent on them. It gives them a feeling of strength that they're able to take care of these people. Other people find it a nuisance. They want people to be independent so they can do their own things. So they're, not, they're not interested in, in this trip. It's all sorts of attitudes. And they very they different want parts to be of independent but still rely on you. That's yes, the that's the problem. <laughs> that's they don't the want to listen, but they don't want to feed themselves. That is the problem. They don't want to take it uh, to its full extent. It's your problem, not their problem. Uh, yes. It's their problem and our problem. Yep. Hey. Uh, Result is said. The Elio Hanavi is supposed to return the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. If Elio Hanavi has to do it, it's not an easy thing. Okay. So. Uh, then God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied, became very mighty. And because they feared God, he made them houses of substance, like this fine marriages, fine households. And then Pharaoh didn't rely on the midwives, and so he couldn't, so he passed the word around. You know, you get a Jew on the back street and bump him off, don't worry about the police. So he charged all his people, saying, every son that is born cast into the river, and every daughter save alive. Egyptians would just grab the kids on the street and chuck them in the river. Then what happens next? Chapter 2. Very strange verses. And there went the man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a good kid, I guess he has a certain beauty or radiance to Moshe, like, not like to Noah, maybe her uh, health, who knows. She hid him three months. She couldn't hide him any longer. She made him a little boat, a little ark. Noah and Moses. Some say Moses is a reincarnation of Noah, if you believe in reincarnation. So she made him a little ark, too. And she dabbed it with slime and pitch, and she put the kid in and put it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood far off to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens along with her. And she saw this little ark, and she sent her handmaid to get it. And she opened it and saw a kid, a little boy, that cried. 
And she felt sorry for him and said, this is one of those Hebrews children. Then his sister walked over, oh, uh, miss, uh, shall I uh, go and call you a nurse of the Hebrew women? And she may nurse the child for you. Why do you keep this little one? This, like if someone picks up a little cat and takes it home. So why do you keep this little baby? I'll find you a woman to nurse her. And Pharaoh's daughter said, fine, go. She probably wouldn't trust an Egyptian woman to do it. And she called the child's mother. Perfect. She's getting paid for watching her own kid instead of having her kid kid. <laughs> and Pharaoh's daughter sat up there, take this child away and nurse it and I'll pay you. And she took it and nursed it. And the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. He became her son. And she called him Moshe and said, because I drew him out of the water. Is there a problem with that last verse? And she called him Moshe, Ki mina maya mishisihu. I drew him out of the water. Yeah, because it's an Egyptian speaking Hebrew. Right, an Egyptian speaking Hebrew. How do you get out of that one? My theory is, it's not Miss Paro who called him Moshe. It's his mother. She gave the mother the task to nurse and raise this child. So part of that task was to give an appropriate Hebrew name. And the mother gave a name as though she was Miss Pharaoh's representative. Not that she drew him out of the world, Miss Pharaoh did. But she told Miss Pharaoh, uh, Miss Pharaoh, you call him Moshe because I drew him out of the water. That will describe exactly what you did. That's how I would answer it. I wonder how Moshe is uh, written in high, high I don't know. I don't know. Now, what is unusual about the passage I just read? I'll just briefly go through it again. A certain man of the house of Levi took the wife and daughter of Levi, and she had a son, so it was a good kid, and the sister stood nearby, and so forth. The daughter of Pharaoh came down. What is unusual about that whole passage I read? There's a peculiarity of style in that whole passage, which is not typical of the Bible. Well, it's something like when I told some Christians who keep arguing, oh, look, a Savior is born to us little quote passages in Isaiah. And I said, look, if God wanted to talk about Jesus, he would say Jesus. <laughs> There's no reason to hide it. It doesn't say Jesus because it wasn't Jesus. It's talking about something in his time. A Savior is already born to us. It's talking about Hezekiah, the rabbi say, all sorts of possibilities. It's clearly not talking about Jesus. Christian nonsense. So here, too, why aren't there names? Why say a certain man of Levi took a certain daughter of Levi and Pharaoh's daughter without a name comes down. Tradition says her name is Batia. The Torah doesn't say a word about it. And his sister stood from Pharaoh. Uh, Other than the naming of Moshe, there is no name right. listed here. Any suggestions? Because uh, he married her and he wasn't about to marry her. Very who? Ah, you remember. Very good. Is that that? You're not right. allowed to marry anyone. So the Torah wants, doesn't want to speak Lush and Hara? The Jewish definition of Lush and Hara is different from the secular one. In common law, libel is if I tell a lie about you which can hurt you. In Jewish law, no, evil libel talk... Is, libel is true. Libel, is, uh, libel can be true. In Jewish law. And in... And in uh, common law, not. No, no. In common law, it's not. In common law, you must prove that the thing was said that it was false and it was deleterious. This is like basic law. Just the uh, uh, newspaper no, it, it, tells about someone's uh, the recent decisions have been the, life. The recent decisions have been the truth is a defense in libel cases, but it didn't used to be. It used to be the greater the truth, the greater the libel. No, I really uh, not so. It has to be proven false. In Check Jewish it out. Law. Check it out. I have. I went to law school. I remember very distinctly. Libel. Part of the element of libel and slander is that you must say a falsehood. There's a newspaper prints all the uh, sordid details of somebody's life. He can't sue him if it's true. If it's not true, he can sue him. But in Jewish he law... He used to be able to sue him if it was true, even if it was true. You can't go around saying that somebody has been in jail. Sure you can. Sure you can. That's Lush, that's do, Jewish. So the Jewish belief is Lush and Hara is my tongue is holy. Mm -hmm. Speech is holy. God makes the world through Hebrew speech and so forth. So, yeah, Mi Ha'ish, the verse, I believe it's in Psalms, Mi Ha'ish HaChafetz Chaim, who is the man who loves life, all right, live long, it's on the Shon Chamiraz, Fasech Midaber Mirma, two things, keep uh, your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from deceit, seek peace and pursue it. So the man who recognizes the holiness of his 
uh, ability to speak, will only use it to do good and holy and nice things. Even if the things are true, but if they're harmful, he will not utter them. Now, if it's to prevent an actual harmful act, he should utter them. If the neighborhood grocer has moldy food and, and false weights, it's a mitzvah for me to tell someone. If someone's about to go to one of the Bali Chibi Yeshivas, it's not Zionist. They should know it. They should know this place doesn't celebrate Israel Independence Day, that they don't encourage the boys to go in the army. And we don't want that type of yeshiva if we can get a yeshiva, which is not that way, where the boys do go in the army and so forth. But still, who says which way is correct? Well, each of us decides. But once you decide which is correct, you have a duty to inform anybody who might be interested of the nature of the thing which they're about to buy or explore. They might not be what they're looking for. Uh, that's reasonable. So, so are you saying that, that it's like because they use a certain kind of meat in the salami that you don't like, that you'll go ahead and advertise to everybody they use this terrible meat in the salami. Yes, you might if but, people But everybody about. else might like that kind of meat. Then they don't buy that anymore. No. You no. just you point, point out the facts. Say, I don't like it. You yeah, say, that's, that's like quite it. different. This is an ideological thing. Many people would look, for example, I'll never forget, I was at Asian yeah, Terror wedding, and someone pointed out to me, what a beautiful scene. All these young men who have left being yuppies and hippies, they're not out on pleasure trips, they're not on career trips. They're studying the Torah and they'll grow up to make nice Jewish families. It's really a beautiful scene, and that's true. But I can see an Israeli saying the opposite in a way, saying, oh, what a horrible scene. All the young men of this country are going off to join the army and sacrifice their lives to protect us. And these guys go into this religious trip to get out of it. And the Israeli public may have a good point on their side. So I think that there is a, a duty to point out facts in a situation which may make a prospective purchaser not want to purchase. It's, it's, it's stopping a, a wrong in the world because that's not what the man wants to so buy. Here's, here's, a, here's a question phrased. Yeah, this is just a side thing, so let's not make it too okay. long. I'll, 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 it's, it's, yeah. I'll uh, bring it another time. I All right. So now, so, so the unusual thing is the lack of names in this passage. And the rabbis say, because indeed, uh, Moshe's father married uh, his own aunt, Levi's daughter. Hammer married Yocheved his aunt. And that's an incestuous relationship. And the Torah doesn't want to talk about Shinar here. It doesn't want to identify this sordid business that this man took his aunt to. But just as a certain Levite married a Levite woman, and uh, that's enough. And they don't even name the sister, least identification possible. But did they keep the rules then? Ah, that's a good question of what I'm saying. Let me just hold that question a moment. Now, the question then would come, how do we know, in fact, if God's keeping quiet about it, how do we know, in fact, that it was his aunt? How do we know that Yochebed was Amram's aunt? Well, that's true. Father Robert says so. So we'll leave that for next week as to why it says so next week. But this week, it just hides it, okay? Well, I think that'll be enough on this issue. And then Bakparo is not named, I would say, because the Torah wants to stress she's Pharaoh's daughter. And even though she's Pharaoh's daughter, and, and can get in trouble and maybe endanger her own position by doing this, it may even be a certain extent. Now why isn't Pharaoh named? Pharaoh himself. I'm sorry? Why isn't Pharaoh named? Which Pharaoh? Ah, because the essence is he's Pharaoh, it's not his yeah. person that which is the essence. Okay. So Pharaoh's daughter defies her father, in a sense, made by taking this kid. I mean, he goes along with it then, when, the, when, the, when he's adopted. And the father was right, this kid is going to bring trouble. Now, what happens next? Moshe grew up in the royal court. Moshe had it good. Moshe really had it good. He was living in a palace. He probably had loads of money, a Ferrari chariot, uh, whatever he wanted to eat, nice clothes. And his relatives... Let better off forgotten. They're slaves, maltreated, discontent, schleppy looking. Every time he goes near the Kotel, they ask him for an Adava. He better uh, stay away from that. But no, Moshe was growing up, he went out unto his brethren and looked, meaning he had insight into their burdens, I would say. And he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no man, he smote the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Very strange story. Depends what smote means here. Hey, was the Egyptian killing the Jew? Or he just was hitting him. 
If it was saying him, it's very hard to understand. Very hard. I mean, Egyptians hit Jews every day, I'm sure. That was the nature of the game. Because people, that's right, people beat their slaves every day. Sure, so why should Moshe risk his position? It wasn't even maybe a right thing to do. Because in the position he was in, he might eventually be able to help the Jews somehow. And here, to save one guy from a beating in one day, he risked his position. That's one question. Second question, what do you mean he looked about? Of course he looked about. Why does the Torah bother to tell us that? It doesn't tell us what brand of hammer he used or how he did it. Did, did he use this type of punch or that type of punch? Uh, did he jump him? What did he do? No, it's not of interest to us. So why does the Torah say he looked this way and that way? And he saw there was no man. Well, of course, if we just said he looked this way and that way and him, we would know he saw nobody. A very difficult passage. So when you look in the rabbinical explanations, there's some very interesting things. The rabbis say the same expression, Egyptian man, Ish Mitzri, is used somewhere else. Where? About Moshe. When, he went to the, the when Moshe himself went to uh, Midian, Midian, Midian and, and the Midian. daughters told the Yitro, the Egyptian man saved yeah. us, which the rabbis say is why Moshe never merited burial in Israel, because Joseph always identifies an Ivri, and his, he was really a secret Zionist. Yosef equals Sion in Gematria. And Moshe had himself look like an Egyptian, that they thought he was an Egyptian. So that's why Moshe didn't marry burial in Israel. Who else is called Ish Mitzri? There's one other Ish Mitzri, at least in the Torah. Who else? Yeah. You got it? In the Midbar. Right, in the Midbar. No, the other one. The Megadev. The Ish, who's the blasphemer. He's called the son of Ish Mitzri, exactly the same term, and a Jewish woman from the tribe of Dan. Right? So the rabbis say this is the same Egyptian man. What's the story here? They used to send the Jews far away to labor camps. They wanted to break their spirit and break their families. So they'd send them to Siberia or something like that. And what did this Egyptian do? He sent his Jewish slave away. And then when he was away, he crept into his tent at night. All right, the Sheik of Araby at night when you're asleep and two out of your tent are creep. And he pretended to be the husband. And the woman probably was half out of it and didn't realize, and he slept with her. Then when out of that union came this, this tormented, sick individual who blasphemed God's name. He wasn't an Egyptian, he wasn't a Jew. That's how it happened. How did it happen a Jewish woman, all of a sudden, was living with an Egyptian man, such a mixed marriage, when they were slaves? How could it be? This is how it could be. All right? So that's the rabbi's story. If he was a slave, he could have raped her. He didn't have to sneak around. Yes, his well, again, it's not so clear how much they would have done openly, like the midwife. It's not clear. Well, and, was and so what the story... Was an Egyptian man who went to... The tent of the Jewish woman? Yes, but the way the rabbis say this, use of the same term in both places, the term want to tell, wants to tell you, it's the same Egyptian man. And therefore, uh, what Moshe saw was this. The one who was born from this was relation. The Egyptian man who beat the slave was the same Egyptian man who was the father of the blasphemer through this act of taking the man's wife. Then when the man came back from his work detail, he hit him. Of course, he can't stand to face him. He has to make him guilty. He found some infraction in him. When Moshe saw that, that he was beating him after sending him away and taking him his wife, that Moshe couldn't take it. He exploded and killed him. It wasn't just a regular guy hitting his servant. Got it? Now, just one more thing on this. Moshe looked all around. There's an argument against killing an Arafat or a Hitler. Even if you're convinced these are so rotten, it's not likely to do Juba. And they cause so much harm. But there's one argument maybe against killing such a man, Hitler and Arafat. What's the argument? Will Hitler make the Jewish state of Israel? All right, but you better, you know, not stay in the that horror maybe. Let God take care of that. The argument is who knows, he may have some nice children. The Buchanetzer's descendants sat in B'nai Brach. Not so inconceivable, and good politicians there. So it, it could be that somebody good will come from it. So some say that Moshe at that point even had prophetic insight and he looked this way and that way and saw there was no man. That there was no real man who would be a descendant from then he killed the Egyptian. All right, Bora. Okay, there, there was a, a very interesting word in, in, a, in a book called Atiri Torah. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. And, and the word was that the Israel-like man was like a foreman 
who was over the other Jews. And the Egyptian was like one of those whose job it was to rouse the foreman so that they would then bring the Jews because the Egyptians didn't want to get his hand dirty. Mm -hmm. He had, you know, like a, a group of Jews. Yes, we have that later. We have that later when they cut the straw. It says that mm -hmm. he went to the Jews who were and, over there. And so this, this book, Atiri Torah, brought this down. Yeah, where would he see that this was a foreman? There's no, it just says it kill hurting a Jew. There's nothing here that would say the man was a foreman, so I find that difficult. I don't know his source. Okay. Uh, so he went out another day, and he saw two Jews fighting. And, he, and again, he said, why are you hitting your fellow? And he said, who are you to be the ruler and judge? You want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Oybe. Moshe feared and said, the thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard about it, he wanted to kill Moshe. Uh, he didn't look very well. Huh? He didn't look very ah, well this way. That's again why I yeah. interpret it. Not that they look physically. No, the Jew saw. They said the Jew who was saved squealed. Don't no, forget, there's one person who knew about it, the Jew who was saved. You shouldn't say the Jew then. Maybe. Oh, you get some wild Midrashim like that. There's one Midrash which says that Moshe saw Pharaoh taking little babies and putting them in the bricks and so forth, like the German Jamach Shimon. And he decided to save one, and then that kid later grew out bad, and God says, why are you interfering with my world? You get some way out by rushing like that sometimes, too. You never know. We never know anything. That's the Purim and Yom Kippurim theme. Adelo Yada, who will live, who will die, what's good, what's bad. It's very hard, very hard. We know that there was mitzvahs we have to do, but in judging life situations, what's the best course to pursue? We're mostly in the dark in an you age where there's no prophecy. Huh? That comes down from the sky, that's all that you never know. Yeah, and it's also quick. <laughs> life is over before you know it. Yeah. And you don't know each moment you're taking a right course, a wrong course, what's going to happen from it. Yeah. Very hard to know what to do. And the whole thing just runs by. Okay. So, onward. So Moshe ran away at this point, and he went to Midian, and he sat down by a well. Yaakov comes to a well. A well is a, uh, a common symbol of Jewish destiny, the Torah, and so forth. According to rabbinic tradition, a long time elapsed till he got to Midian, and he temporarily ran to Ethiopia. He married the, the widow queen of Ethiopia. He ruled Ethiopia for a while, and then he finally wound up in Midian. Yeah, yeah. All right. This is because he's about 80 when God uh, calls him to his mission. And he's apparently a young man at this point. He was 69 when he came to Midian. Mm -hmm. so That's one like calculation. That. Okay. So Moshe, he, yeah, he, he sat down by a well, and the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water. Mrs. Telsner said last year in this room, I think, of course, uh, of course they came to draw water because he had to get those girls married off. So he sent them yeah. and, and in the zakut of that nice word of Torah, one of her daughters got married this year. So uh, he was. Uh, all these seven daughters were sent down to the well, and they got hassled. They would uh, fill the troughs to water the father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. You know, you girls wait. We'll do our business first. And Moshe stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And they came to Ruel, their father, and said, How come you're home so soon today? Apparently every day they would nudge them. He said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherds. This is the idea that Moshe was called an Egyptian. And moreover, he drew water for us and watered the flock. He said, where is he? Why don't you call him in? Let him eat something. And he came in. He was happy with this man. He got along with you, true. And he gave Moshe Tzipora his daughter, one away, six to go. And she bore a son, and he called his name Gershom. He realized after this whole episode, growing up in the palace of Egypt, he was really a stranger. Just like Yaakov says to Esau, in love and Garti. All those years with love and all the prosperity, I was really a stranger and didn't belong there. Like the Jew in the Western world today, perhaps. I've been a stranger in a strange land. In the course of many days, the king of Egypt died, and then in a brief respite, possibly we die. In mourning, the Jews really moaned inside. They were maybe too busy to cry before. And God heard their cry and groaning, and they remembered his covenant with Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov. And God saw the children of Israel. He had insight. And he knew, again, knew doesn't just mean he knew information-wise, but God empathized and really felt what they were feeling. Right? So we're up to chapter 3. Um, tell me, what kind of priest do you think Yitro was? For the good guys or the bad guys? Was he a priest of God or was he a priest of God? Well, that's that the rabbis say, but from the text, huh? He was a good priest. How do you know? 
He was a nice man, maybe, but how do you know they, they believed in God rather than idols? Yes. I well, think he, he, uh, he was looking for the truth. That's the point. Well, that's all nice theories and measures, but from the maybe. text, can you get anything? Sure. Whatever Midian was worshipping, that's what he was a priest of. He was the priest of Midian. He priest of Midian. What were what the Midian Idols. Priests? They were uh, idolaters. Uh, I would disagree with you. Now, see if anybody can figure why I disagree with Boris. Boris is the simple answer. He's a priest of Midian. Priest of Midian was an idol uh, leader. That the place where he was wasn't uh, it's Midian. Well, it says he was a Midian. No, as he was the priest of Midian. Yeah, no, it says point. Moshe came to Midian. He was their high priest, wasn't he? Fine. He feed, when the, the way I disagree with him, you. He says I was, he was the priest. Of I disagree with you. Now, picture it both ways. Picture him as a priest of God. Do we have priests of God in those days? Sure. sure. Who? Machitzedek, king of Shalem, Jerusalem. Praise the eternal God. There's priest at least to the God of nature, Elohim. But I say to you, he was, in fact, or at least... I say he abandoned idolatry. Why? I think I heard this from Sol I'm not sure who, but it's very sensible. All right. Picture the chief rabbi of Israel, at least for a moment. Picture a chief rabbi of Israel. How is he treated? Respect. Rabbi of the Yahoo. With great respect. With great respect and honor. Uh, How are his daughters treated? With great respect and honor. They're the daughters of the rabbi. Got it? Mm -hmm. So if his daughters have to schlep the water. And not only that, the shepherds abuse them and give them troubles. That's a very good sign that indeed he's a defrocked peace, priest of Mecca. That he's leaving the traditional beliefs in idolatry. He may not believe in God yet. Because later he says, now I know that the Lord is God. But you see that he's on the way. And he's out there somewhere in the desert. Oh, I remember Defra Moshe teaches him. Yeah, that's these are midrash from. He's going by text. Yeah. So the text shows us a priest who is treated with disrespect, which would indicate that he was already leaving the faith. Okay? Very simple, very nice textual deduction. Chapter 3. And yet, when Moshe said to him, Stay with us, no, because he wanted to go back and help his folks. Uh, the rabbis say he wanted to bring them all to Bede Noach or something. Give them universal religion. You know, not the silly claim of the Christians that God only related to the Jews for thousands of years then went public. Because that implies he ignored the public for thousands of years. But we had a religion for everybody. The seven laws of the sons of Noah for thousands of years from the time of, uh, of Adam and Noah. So uh, those who say that he went home, he, not to convert them necessarily to Judaism, but to bring them a uh, monotheistic religion of the seven laws of the sons of Noah. Were any of his daughters married at that time? Apparently not. He had seven daughters going down to the well. I don't Was, know. Wasn't one of his names Putiel? It's very, there's a lot of names used for Yitro. Some say the names are partially his, partially his father's, maybe his grandfather's. Some say it's all one person who had different names because he was a very multifaceted personality. Who knows? Like Yaakov Yisrael. So Moshe's, Moshe was taking care of the sheep of Yitro. And he led them way out to the wilderness. The rabbi said because he didn't want to poach on anybody's ground. And he came to the mountain of God. He wasn't looking for it, apparently. To Chorev. And the an angel appeared to him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and he saw the bush burn with fire and it wasn't consumed. Huh, that's interesting. Moshe said, I'll turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When God saw he turned aside to see, God called. He said, Moshe, Moshe. He said, here I am. He said, don't come near. Take your shoes off. You're staying on the holy ground. He said, I'm the God of your father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moshe hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord tells him, I've seen the affliction of the Jews, and he's going to save them, and so forth. All right. Now, there's something interesting. Yes, there's a when lot of meets, interesting things here. When he meets the, uh, the goat, he finds, he finds a goat. Nothing in the text about it. No, uh, uh, I'm talking about in the bush, or is, it, is that a different story? In the bush, is, uh, that's the story of the, yes, the, the, walk with it, the, ram, the ram caught by its horns in the thicket by Abraham's attempt at sacrifice of Isaac. Wow. But here it just sees a bush. All right. What is, uh, why does God pick Moshe? For what we've read in the text, does he convert people, look for God like Abraham? No. Nothing word about his being religious in the text. No. Nothing. Zilch. But he's fortunate for the only Jew who wasn't a slave at the time. 
Interesting. And, and he was also uh, he friendly was with Pharaoh. He was safe. Well, he family. was a high he class person who could be a leader. Some say that's why he had to grow up in Pharaoh's house. He knew Pharaoh. He could speak 70 languages. Uh, he knew. He was prepared. Yeah, he, he could do all the could be. magic of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh, yes, and Aaron was in that position. That's an interesting answer. That God picked him because he's the only one who had the right background to take the Jews out of Egypt. However, looking at that a little deeper, why did God make it that he was the only one who had the background to take the Jews out of Egypt? Someone else could have been picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, what is there innate in Moshe that God wants him to be the leader and sets up the circumstances? Well, God had something what blemish. He had is there some, a reason? He had the blemish about his background, his family, yes. his parents. That we'll get to next week again. The very fact that he had a blemish background. Oh, by the way, I don't think I answered your question. You asked me, what's so terrible if he married his aunt that wasn't prohibited before the terror? And you're correct, because only maternal incestual relationships are permitted to non-Jews under the Noachide laws. Paternal ones are not prohibited. When Lo takes his daughters, it may be an unseemly deed, but it's not a technical violation of the Noachide code. Because we recognize mother-son relationships, not father-daughters, by the Noah. Still, I would answer you back. The Torah says these nations were thrown out of Israel for doing all the terrible things which the Jews are not to do, including marrying your auntie. So even though it wasn't forbidden, it's a rather ugly and disgusting thing, which God clearly indicates nobody should do. And therefore, he, he uh, refrains from talking about it vis-a-vis uh, -vis Moshe here. Yes, brother. I, I heard a very nice word from Rabbi Kuko about uh, Yehuda and saying that Yehuda's real strength was that he was able to come back from the Moras and, and come back from all of the bad that happened to him. And, and, and the same with Moshe. Moshe, because Moshe was into the, this house and he had a place because then he was able to return. And in his return from, 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 from a good place, he was able to carry as a leader, as a king, all of those who were, were, were also... That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Moshe... The very fact he recognized that was a stranger in a strange land, he could pull himself out of a bad environment, is one of his very, very good traits. Can you see anything else? What else distinguishes Moshe? Very simply, Moshe is an activist who butts into everybody's business. Like Yaakov sees the shepherds, how come you're around the water hole? It's still the middle of the day. There are people who have the Jewish ideal, not the contemporary ideal. That everybody's business is my business. Any way I can improve the world, I should try to do so. Of course, if you see that you're turning people off and they find you obnoxious and they're not interested in, in your correcting them, then, then you're forbidden to do it because it's counterproductive. Scream Shabbos at the moviegoers, you're, you're committing a sin because you're making them want to violate Shabbos more. So you're, you're supposed to be involved in everyone else's business and tell them things, but only if you can do it in such a way that they sort of accept it and listen and talk to you and like you. But if they find you a nudge and a nudnik, then you're not allowed to do it. Or if they're bad people who, who will just give you trouble, then it's forbidden to do it. Okay. So we have Moshe as an activist who appears and tries to make things better. We have him as a shepherd, an occupation of care and tenderness and probably a certain quietness and contemplation. So, and just like David. Because we don't see that the background of the greatest religious leaders is religious, but it's of high morality and care. And then God takes that and builds on to it all kinds of divine revelations and structures. But the basis is that these should be very, very fine people first. That seems to be the pattern that emerges here. Okay. Now, Next, uh, this whole thing of the burning bush, a rather dramatic way God appears. Why does God tell Moshe not to come closer? He's already in a holy place. Just take off your shoes, like if you go up to the temple, man, even if you're allowed to, it must be without shoes. So why does God tell Moshe, don't come near? What's wrong with coming near? Because he says later, if a man gets too close to me, a man can't see me and live. You will no longer be mortal. And God wants you around to improve this world. I don't want you back in heaven with me. And the capitalists who believe the reincarnation, such as the Ari, is against the side of gold, who said it was nonsense. They say, this is why Abel Hevel died. In other words, you could say he died because God gives free will and Cain can kill him. But you could say God controls every action in the world. So if Abel died, he must have deserved it somehow. If you say that, so what did Abel do wrong? He brought a nice sacrifice. 
God liked the sacrifice. That's all he did. So the rabbis say the fire came down from heaven and consumed his sacrifice. Just when, uh, just like when God came down in the fire and consumed Elijah's sacrifice. And he was so enchanted that he wanted to jump in the fire. He no longer wanted to be part of this world. So since that was a sin, <clears throat> excuse me, God took us out of this uh, divine state before we were born. Our souls were with God. And he threw us down to earth to be able to uncover divinity within an obscured earth. So he who wants to run away from this earth to have divine trips is against God's will. And therefore, he deserved to die. It's almost like granting his request. And can't let him die. Now, according to these people who believe in reincarnation, he is reincarnated in Seth, in Chase, which makes sense in a way. Because what does Eve say? God's given me another seed in place of his brother, Hevel. But somehow Chase doesn't work out this weakness either. And then they get a third chance with Moshe. And Moshe, at this moment where he could jump in the fire and holds himself back, and God says, too much divinity is not good for you like too many vitamins. Then Moshe has rectified the fall of Hevel, and that's why his name is Moshe. I drew him out of the water. Moshe, Mem, Shin, Hey. Mem is Moshe, Shin is Shes, Seth, and Hey is Hevel. All right. Cute. Now, Bye. Well, I wanted to suggest he drew him out of the water, out of the ultimate waters, out of return to the womb, out of return to God, out of return to pure Torah. And he pulls him down from the Kolel on Har Sinai to come Wait, and deal Moshe with the problems the of the letters. golden calf disco. Mo as Moshe, Shes, and Hevel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, God says, I heard their troubles. I came down to, to deliver them out. And I'm going to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, and so forth. I heard their cry, and I've seen the Egyptians' oppression. Now, Moshe, I'm going to send you the Pharaoh. Bring them out from Egypt. Moshe said, please, who am I? I'm a shepherd. I ran away. I have no business there in Egypt. How can I bring children to Israel? He says, don't worry, I'll be with you. And I'll even give you a sign that someday they're going to serve God on this mountain. What kind of sign is that they should take them out? God's saying, no, you're not going to take them out. It's okay. I'll take them out. You'll just be a messenger boy. But what your great thing is, as you took care of the sheep, you will teach my sheep. And you will take a slave people in other degeneration, and they will soon worship God on this mountain under your tutelage. That's your sign. That's your task. All right? And Moshe said to God, when I come to the children of Israel, I say, the God of your father sent me to you. They'll say, what's his name? What is he? Who is he? He says, I am that I am. I'm not definable. But I'm existent. And you shall say to the children of Israel, I cause existence, I am a sent me to you. And also, there's one way they know God. I know God can communicate with man. I know God's interested in man because he communicate with my great, great, great granddaddy, Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov. That's my name for eternity. And so I shall be known. So give him a double message, okay? God's transcendental existence and involvement, plus the historical contact with God of the Abba. And they'll tell him the whole story, how they're coming out of Egypt, and they'll listen to you. And then you go to the king of Egypt and say, let us go. I, he won't listen to you. Don't worry about it. You're just a messenger boy. Until I really zap him, and then he will listen. And then the Egyptians will not only let them go, they will like the Jews. Like Yaakov's message to the angel of Asaph at the end. Messianic dawn is risen. Bless me. Recognize me as the source of your blessings. It's not enough you stop persecuting me. All right? And they'll give the Jews lots of money and gold. They'll, they'll empty out all of Egypt. Chapter 4, Moshe said, they won't believe me. They'll say it's a hallucination. God didn't appear to you. And God gives them signs. The snake that can turn into a stick and back again. His hand which can turn leprous and back again for doubting the Jewish people. It's a form of Lashon Hara. And he said, these signs will do it. If they won't believe the first, they'll believe the second. And if they won't believe these two, you'll take water and turn it to blood. Then Moshe said, I can't talk. Moshe is fighting this mission. Moshe does not want it. Once he gets used to it, like the, like the divine soul in the human body, it doesn't want to come out. And once we get used to this world, we don't want to leave it. All right, so Moshe said, no, I can't do it. I can't speak. And this is like a little too much already. And then God said, who made man's mouth? Who makes him speak? Now go and I'll be with you. He says, God sent some of his. And God was angry. And he said, look, all right, there's Aaron, your brother, Levite. He's a good speaker, a good orator. He's coming forth to meet you. And he'll be glad. He has no resentment of younger brother making good, just like Ephraim and Manasseh, not like the earlier sets of brothers. And speak to him and you'll be like God. You'll dictate to him and he'll say the words over and take the rod and do the signs. And what's Moshe say? What's Moshe's reply to all this? 
That's correct. Nothing. So Moshe went. He doesn't say yes, doesn't say no now. He went back to Yitro. He says, I want to go see what's happening to my relatives over in Egypt if they're still alive. So go in peace. Yitro is a nice guy. I like Moshe. Moshe doesn't say yet, according to Rav Kanatovsky, that he's taking on the task. He he's just a, says, I'm going to take a look. He's married his daughter by now. Yeah. And the Lord said to Moshe and Midian, go return to Egypt. No. The men are dead and saw your life. Moses takes his wife and sons, puts them on a donkey. That's a higher step. Abraham only put the wood on the donkey. And the Mashiach himself will ride on the donkey. Well, at least there's a connection between family and the material world with Moshe. They went down to Egypt, and then he took the rod of God just in case. It's almost like incidental. Moshe still hasn't made up his mind. And then God says, make sure you do all these wonders. Even though he won't let you go, I'll harden his heart. And tell him, if you don't let my firstborn son go, says God, I will kill your firstborn son. Then comes the strange episode of the dotel. In those times, they would stay at a dotel on the trip, a, a donkey hotel instead of a motor hotel. And they parked their donkeys, and they'd have a room there. When they came to the dotel, what happened? All of a sudden, says God tried to kill them. Very, one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. The Lord met him and sought to kill him. What's his wife do? She starts circumcising her kid. Then Sephora took a flint out, cut off the foreskin of her son, threw it at his feet and said, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And then God let him alone. Then she said, a bridegroom of blood in regard to circumcision. Very strange, very strange passage. But Kanatovsky said, that just follows because Moshe's never accepted the mission. But God told him to go. How do you think Moshe feels at that moment? Well, he's going. What, what does God want? He's going to look. He never said he'll do it. He's uh, cautiously taking a look. We'll see how my family is. They took the round along just in case. How do you think Moshe feels? He was frightened that he would Scared to death. And, and ambivalent. Should I do it? Should I do it? He really doesn't want to do this. God himself spoke and Moshe protests. Incredible. He really doesn't want to do this. Yet God told him to do it. He's in the jam. What would be the consequence of such a state? He would die. He would die. He would die. This is a terribly worked up frantic state. The person has to be calm. Any, any tension can hurt you. A tension like this. So that's just what means God sought to kill him. This confrontation with God was killing him. And then it happened to be time when they got to the hotel to circumcise <coughs> their son. Which son isn't clear here? Gershon yes. or? Gershon. Who was the other son? Nobody knows. Right? Elias. No. Elias. Elias. Why did no one know for a while? Because it's not mentioned here. It's only mentioned later. So it's not clear which son and why that son is not mentioned. So she has to circumcise the kid because Moshe's in no shape to do so. When she does the circumcision, she suddenly realizes, what's this all about the circumcision of these Jews? Oh, yeah, they have a blood confident with God that all their powers are subdued and dedicated to God, even at the cost of their life. Moshe, you better take that mission. Uh, and then he does. And he says, ah, you are a bridegroom of blood for circumcision. Uh, and then, he, then God lets him go. The tension is gone. He's decided he's doing it. Got it? That's how Rev. Katowski reads the whole passage. I, I, I think it's more to the uh, circumcision because while the Jews were in Egypt, as it became slaves in circumcising their sons. No, no, no. Was Jewish, so well, was Jewish. Yes, we know. First of all, nobody's Jewish yet before Sinai, but they had the covenant of circumcision. Now, let's finish it up quickly. Uh, it's true, the Jews in Egypt may not have been circumcised. It's not clear. But anyway, they knew that this is what the Jews do. It's like it's like the Jew comes to Israel, he's all worried about Kashrus and Shabbos, what should they do? And he gets there and he finds out the natives aren't doing this stuff, most of them. So the same thing, oh, oh, we're going to meet the Jews, my people back there, so remember, make sure that kid's circumcised. Then they get to Egypt, they find the Jews aren't doing it, maybe, who knows? And the Lord said to Aaron, that's what the Reformed convert claims, he just wants to be like the other Jews. Now, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moshe, and he went with happiness, and they went and gathered the elders, and the people believed Moshe was wrong, and they bowed down to worship, then it's time to actually not just say the pretty words, but to do something about it. And they went out and said to Pharaoh, God said, let us go. Pharaoh said, goodbye. Don't bother me. I'm not interested. Who's the Lord? I should, I should listen to him. I won't let them go. He said, the God of the Hebrews met with us. Let us go three days' journey. Otherwise, God's going to kill us. And you'll be the loser. And he said, look, you're bothering people with all this nonsense because you're not working hard enough. And he makes them now gather their own straw. A huge new burden. And when they don't quite make it, he hits their taskmasters themselves. 
And the people ran all around frantically gathering straw. They had to give the same number of bricks. And Pharaoh said, because you're lazy, that's why you want to go out and sacrifice to God. You got to work without the straw. And, and then the leaders met Moshe and Aaron. They said, look what you've done. You messed things up. You made it worse. Before, Pharaoh just depressed us terribly. Now he absolutely hates us. He's on an extermination campaign. God judged between you and us. And Moshe returned to God and said, God, what did you do to this people? And he's talking back to God. God might punch him, but God understands he's doing it out of his love for the people. And his frustration that it turned out bad at first. Any determined effort is not going to meet with success at first. He says, Lord, why have you dealt ill with this people? Why did you send me? He says, again, the prayer, it's much worse. You didn't help anything. And then the beginning of chapter 6 occurs here. And the Lord said to Moshe, Ah, oh, you'll see what I'll do to Pharaoh. Not only will he let you go, he'll send you out. For by a strong hand will he let them go. By a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Okay? And uh, we speak of the ups and downs of the Jewish people. They're uh, going into Gaulus, and they're coming out of it to eventually build something better and inspire the world. That's the theme of our Haftorah from Isaiah. Right. And the end is, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Yaakov shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now wax pale when he sees his children, young Israelis, the work of my hands in the midst of him, that they sanctify my name, night she should behead their boys. They'll sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and stand in awe of the God of Israel. As Eddie Cantor used to say, same time, same station next week. I'd love to spend each Wednesday with you. Friend to friend, I can't say I'm sorry it's through because we're all tired, but it was nice.